it gives me immense pleasure now to invite Professor Rashmi Sarkar, who is uh, a force behind this uh, topic, today's topic, therapeutics in skin of color patients. So she will be going to address and uh, will be explaining what are the objective for this meeting in collaboration with SOCS and International Journal of Dermatology. I mean, as is usually the, it's said that uh, Professor Rashmi Sarkar needs no introduction. And if I, I mean, start introducing her, I may be, I think for another 20 minutes, I may require to elaborate her achievements, but just uh, briefly describe her. She's Director Professor, Department of Dermatology, Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. He's, she's a president of IDBL. She's on the board of director of International Society of Dermatology. She's a former editor-in-chief of Pigment International. She's on various editorial roles of various international and national journals. She has received Dr. B.M. Ambedi Oration of IDBL in 2019, Dr. B.M. Seigel Memorial Award in 2020, all prestigious awards like Dr. K.C. Kandari Memorial Award, Dr. B.B. Satyanarayan Oration, Dr. Madhusudan Das Oration. So there are so many other achievements. I mean, uh, everybody in India knows that how energetic she is and she's giving more than her 100% to contribution to IDBL and other society. Dr. Rashmi Sarkar, please. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm namaste to all of you. And uh, from all of us at IADVIN, you know, we are very happy to be here today because, uh, as you know, the tagline for this year, rather the motto for this year is 50 golden years of IADVIN, and it is building future leaderships and international collaborations. Now, going in that vein, what we did was we decided to have these wonderful collaborative meetings with the international dermatology societies. All of us are always working in some of these societies as committee members. Why not have them? Why not have them introduce what they're all about to the members, as well as also discuss certain academic things and about their society? So that's what it is about. And uh, I have been a part of the Skin of Color Society for a very long period. You know, I've been a member of this. I have enjoyed the benefits whenever I go to the American Academy of Dermatology. I like to, you know, go for their very uh, informative session, which they have in the pre-AD session. They also have a very good global vitiligo forum, which even Dr. Devinder Prasad is a part of. And... Uh, Definitely, it has done a lot, you know, for mentorships, as well as for memberships, for research grants, and so on. I'm also happy to be a mentor on the Skin of Color Society. Of course, I serve as a mentor for a lot of international societies, but this is close to my heart. The society started way back in 2005, because I think I joined it in 2006, but it started somewhere way back in 2005, and we've just seen it growing and growing you know, since then. You will meet many of their members today, including the president, the midget, you know, past president and so many other members. And we all have brown skin, skin which is darker. And so we'll be talking about this. So I'm going to briefly introduce the faculty today, you know, the international and national. And of course, I'd like to, you know, also say a welcome, you know, to Dr. Dinesh Kumar, the Secretary General IDV, who has joined. And again, you know, he will not need an introduction because he's the Secretary General of IDV, but he also happens to be a senior consultant in dermatology, as well as even cosmetic dermatology in Chennai, uh, India. He's also remained, you know, the previous Secretary General of the Association of Cutaneous Surgeons of India and Teledermatology Society of India. So welcome, Dinesh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And again, yeah. And then again, let me start with the other speakers, you know, of today. Dr. Seemal R. Desai, I think the Indian or the IADVL audience knows him very well. He's been a friend. He's a clinical assistant professor of dermatology at the University of Texas 
Southwestern. He's also the President Medical Director's Innovative Dermatology, but most importantly, he's the President Elect, the incoming President Elect of the American Academy of Dermatology, which by far is a very pretty big feat. And he's a very young person to do it, and that also of Asian origin. So he'll be talking on vitiligo. Then we have Dr. Donald A. Glass. So Donald is an assistant professor in the Department of Dermatology, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He's the immediate past president of Skin of Color Society. Next, please. Dr. Valerie M. Harvey who's the co-director, Skin of Color Research Institute, Hampton University, USA. She also happens to be the current president, Skin of Color Society, 2022-23. Dr. Sean Quatra, who's an associate professor of dermatology at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He also happens to be a director at John Hopkins Itch Center. So you're going to have a plethora of topics. And last, one more slide is there. Okay, Dr. Devendra Prasad, again, he doesn't need an introduction to our Indian audience, as well as the international one. But it's important to say that he's a professor at PGIM Mia Chandigarh in the Department of Dermatology. And uh, he's been the past president, Asian Society of Pigment Cell Research, coordinator of Asian Region for World Vitiligo Consensus Group, member European Task Force on Vitiligo and Member Scientific Advisory Board Vitligo Research Foundation. He's chaired, co chaired, presented, invited guest lectures, papers on Vitligo for more than 150 international conferences, meetings. He's also received the Ambadi Oration of Indian Association of Dermatologists, Venereologists, and Leprologists 2006. A very high honor that is, which is given, that is in uh, IIT Bill. And his areas of interest are, of course, Vitligo, which we all know. So with that, I think I finished the introductions and uh, we are good to go. So we will be starting off with the lectures, which uh, you know we start off with the first lecture of Vitlaiko and they would be one after another. I would like to request the audience, if you have questions, please keep typing them. And you know, uh, Naveen is going to put them in our chat. We will take them up at the end. Dr. Davinder Prasad will do the question and answer after I you know, ask Dr. Valerie to speak a few words. We'll do some questions. After that, you know, the closing remarks would be made by Dr. Dinesh Kumar. So that is the flow of events. So thank you so much. Over to you, Naveen. A practice in Dallas, Texas. One of my passions is treating pigmentary disorders, in particular vitiligo. And I'm happy to be with you here today to talk about what's new in vitiligo therapies and give you some clinical pearls and potpourri. This talk will include lots of what's new, what's on the horizon, what's coming, and what's not. And if you have any questions throughout the talk, please feel free to reach out to me on social media, on Twitter or Instagram at smallrdesimd or via email, and it would be my pleasure to try to be of assistance. I do have a number of disclosures that I want to share with you, which involve clinical research as well as consulting work that I've done in the areas of pigmentary disorders in my private and clinical practice. These are listed here. Some of these will include clinical research, and I am going to be sharing some data today, as well as discussing some things that are investigational and things that have been approved for the treatment of this condition. So let's start off by talking about some vitiligo statistics. The worldwide prevalence of vitiligo can range anywhere from 1 in 250 to as common as 1 in 50 individuals, depending on the study or on the publication that you actually look at. I always tell my patients, this is not a disease that is more male predominant or more female predominant. It's really predominantly equal sex affected condition. And over half of the patients who have vitiligo, remember, will show signs before the age of 20. And that's increasingly why it's important to screen your vitiligo patients for psychological conditions, including major depressive disease and screening them for other comorbidities. 
So I thought I would break up today's talk into a few different sound bites that I think are going to be really helpful for you as we navigate our journey in how you approach and counsel your patient with vitiligo. And many of you know that I've dedicated my career to pigmentary diseases because of my own family's personal struggle with this condition when my younger brother was diagnosed with vitiligo at the age of a and has come to terms with this disease, but I haven't been in a family who suffered this, I can tell you that the entire family is affected by the impact of this condition, particularly from areas in certain parts of the world where cultural nuances and social stigmata oftentimes accompany this diagnosis, as was the case where we experienced in my family being of an Indian background. So when we talk about our first soundbite, one of the things I always like to do is tell my vitiligo patients, what's the good news about having this disease? Many of these patients come in, they're very scared, they're nervous, they want answers, they expect me as one of the experts to be able to cure these, this condition. And I tell these patients very upfront, this is not a disease that is curable, but this is a disease that we can help make better. And there are some good things about having vitiligo. The first is if you have vitiligo, you're much less likely to have melanoma. In fact, there is a threefold lower risk for vitiligo patients to develop melanoma compared to the general population. So it's important to share some positive outlook with the patient. The other thing that I'll mention is that if the patient has facial involvement, I'll say, oh, that's fabulous. It's fabulous that you have facial disease. And the patients look at me like I'm crazy. Why is this guy who's supposed to be the expert so happy that I have facial involvement? Well, it's not that I'm happy they have the disease, but I'm happy they have the disease in an anatomic area where I know I can make an impact. And I have seen countless numbers of patients where if they follow a combinational therapy approach with topicals, potentially systemic therapy, UV phototherapy, and potentially antioxidants, that we can get up to 80%, if not more, of facial lesions fully repigmented over time. And so the face is fabulous from a therapeutic response perspective. Now we know that there's a variety of treatment options in our therapeutic armamentarium for vitiligo, including topical steroids, vitamin D analogs, and calcineurin inhibitors. We also have systemic treatments with systemic steroids, phototherapy or UV light treatment, surgical modalities, and of course, for those patients who want a full reversal of their own natural skin tone or have widespread unstable vitiligo, depigmentation is an option that's somewhat a last resort. But I think it's always important to analyze your patient's desires, meaning ask the patient, what part of the body bothers you the most? Where do you want us to try to bring the color back? A large majority will say, I want all of it gone. I want all of it better. But I've had patients who say, it's only my face I'm worried about. I don't care about anywhere else. Or I've had patients from certain cultures, for example, my, many of my Islamic Muslim patients are not so much worried about areas where they're covered, they're more worried about their hands because certain parts of their bodies in traditional cultural clothing will remain covered. So ask the patient, what part of your body of depigmentation bothers you the most? And where would you like us to assess an a, approach for aggressive treatment? One of the things that I like to do, and I've learned this from my colleagues in India, actually, is oral mini pulse systemic steroid therapy, where we stabilize vitiligo using two consecutive days per week of systemic steroids. Dexamethasone, four milligrams consecutively, usually Saturday, Sunday, and you could do this for a six, eight week increment and potentially even longer, depending on mineralocorticoid side effects. You can also do this in your younger population. For example, in someone, let's say, who's age 13 or 14, you can half the dose to two milligrams if they're less than 16 years of age. I do always have a discussion with the pediatrician prior to doing this so I can make sure it's shared decision making. And you want to, of course, counsel these patients on systemic steroid side effects. Now, this is an example of a patient with skin type 6, obviously very disfiguring vitiligo. You can actually tell this patient has very unstable disease simply by looking not at the deep pigmented areas, which are very disfiguring, but notice this hypopigmented area in the cheek. Remember, vitiligo does not become depigmented 
until it goes through a hypopigmented loss of melanin melanocyte phase first. It's just a matter of catching it. And oftentimes we don't see patients until they're fully depigmented. But when you see hypopigmented areas or another feature, which I'll share with you shortly, that is definitely unstable advancing disease. This is an example of a patient who still needs work, but you can see in about a four to five week period, already small perifollicular islands of repigmentation coming back alongside the use of topical treatments and phototherapy. So I do use oral mini pulse frequently, but I combine that with other modalities. Also, antioxidants in vitiligo are very, very important and a key component of my therapeutic armamentarium. I use lots of polypodium leucotomus, typically in the dose of 240 milligrams, which is available here in the US, twice daily or once daily, depending on which formula you use and potentially getting the 480 milligram. There are higher rates of repigmentation that have been shown in papers, such as this one that was published in the JEADV with the use of oral polypodium leucotomus for patients in phototherapy. So I do include this as an antioxidant. It's a dietary supplement. It's a fern extract, typically from a fern plant that's found in South America, and I find it to be helpful. I also use lots of antioxidants like alpha lipoic acid, vitamin C, and vitamin E, and combining that as an oral supplement especially in combination with narrowband UVB, is also helpful. And I find this to be an additional item that I'm going to add onto my therapeutic armamentarium. And patients oftentimes like taking these supplements and they feel a more holistic approach when you offer them vitamin treatment. Let's look at our second sound bite. Sound bite pearl number two, these beautiful Hawaiian black pearls. Family risk always is an issue and people always ask. I have vitiligo and I'm so worried I'm going to pass it on to my children. In general, you can give them some very good news. There's only about a 6%, so less than 10% chance of passing vitiligo to your child. So when the patient is the only one in the family affected, the risk to develop vitiligo for his or her children is below 10%. The other thing that comes up is that patients also ask, well, I'm going to do all these treatments. I'm going to be very committed. What's going to happen after I repigment? Am I going to lose the color again? Well, it is possible. And I do tell patients that the risk of re-depigmentation after achieving a complete or almost complete repigmentation is between about 40 to 50%. Around 40% is an accurate number. So 60% of the lesions that fully repigment should stay that way. About 40% can relapse, and that's why maintenance treatment and coming up with a long-term plan is critically important. Now, what's some of the new things that are on the horizon? Well, it will be very interesting, and my hope is that in a few years, we'll even have lab tests that will become mainstream where we can draw blood levels to predict disease activity. And this was a very nice paper that was published in archives of dermatological research that showed that systemic CXCL10 levels are actually a predictive biomarker of vitiligo lesional skin infiltration. And what that means is that there are going to be ways for us hopefully down the road to draw levels of potentially CXCL10 or other biomarkers and give patients more insight into Yes, this could be something that can get worse for you. Your disease is very active, even though you're not noticing new spots. So it's important to keep in mind that there's lots of new studies on the horizon. This is another example where antibody blockade of IL-15 signaling is fascinating. What's been shown is that IL-15 levels are high in vitiligo patients, and that IL-15 is what allows those CD8 T resident memory cells, the T memory cells, to be hiding in the skin so that even once you repigment, you can re-depigment because those T memory cells are there waiting to attack those melanocytes. So what if we had a biological drug in a few years that blocked IL-15 signaling that helped to durably reverse vitiligo? That would be amazing. 
Now that leads me to something that's really exciting, which is the JAK inhibitor therapy for vitiligo. So we know that vitiligo is a CD8 T cell mediated disease that is triggered oftentimes by oxidative stress and cellular damage leading to CXCL9 and CXCL10 levels getting increased in the skin, allowing CD8 T cells to be recruited. And then this JAK signaling becomes activated in CD8 positive T cells that subsequently secrete interferon gamma that cause CD8 T cell mediated melanocyte destruction. And in this phase three paper of a 52 week study, we actually showed the efficacy of ruxolitinib cream in these randomized double-blinded parallel phase three studies of a JAK-1-2 inhibitor. These were the co-authors on this paper. This was published first at the European Academy in October of 2021. And I'm pleased to tell you that just in July of 2022, the US Food and Drug Administration actually FDA approved topical ruxolitinib 1.5% cream for the treatment and repigmentation of vitiligo in patients aged 12 and up. Very exciting and a truly historic moment for this disease. So this was the study design, two parallel studies. Patients were randomized with vehicle, treated in a double blind fashion for 24 weeks, and then followed out for a total of 52 weeks. The primary efficacy endpoint was to look at the patient's improvement in their F VASI score. F VASI score means facial VASI, VASI 75 endpoint. You may have heard of POSI scores in psoriasis or easy scores in eczema. VASI score is part of vitiligo. Secondary endpoints included the vitiligo noticeability scale for a proportion of patients achieving a lot less noticeable or no longer noticeable vitiligo response percent of change from baseline of their full body surface area and percent of change from baseline of their facial VASI scores and total vitiligo area scoring index. So remember, F VASI is facial vitiligo area scoring index. T VASI is total vitiligo area scoring index. FBSA is facial body surface area, and VNS is vitiligo noticeability scale. As more vitiligo studies get published, you'll see more and more of this coming up. So what you can see is statistical significance, and at week 24, a greater portion of patients achieved the primary efficacy endpoint. And significant results, by the way, were also observed for FBASI 50 and FBASI 90 at week 24. Here's some images showing a beautiful response. This was with monotherapy topicals alone. Look at the beautiful face is fabulous, going back to that theme from earlier. A young girl with facial involvement. This girl is probably very stigmatized, potentially bullied, having a low self-esteem, psychological impact on her and the family. Look at the results. Also, the total vitiligo area scoring index at week 24 was achieved when compared to vehicle, which is really great news. Total meaning not just base, the rest of the areas of involvement. And some nice improvement finally with something for acral vitiligo. So I do use personally this medication very, very frequently as a workhorse in my practice, particularly on acral disease. And I find it to be helpful. Acral disease, of course, being the, one of the hardest areas of vitiligo to treat the hands and feet, particularly fingertip involvement because of the paucity of hair follicles. And keep in mind that fingertip involvement oftentimes predicts instability. Elbow antecubital fossa area. Look at the nice small perifollicular islands. Again, this is monotherapy alone. And safety tends to be an important issue. Now, in the study, the cream was very well tolerated and there were no clinically significant application site reactions. The most common treatment emergent adverse events were the development of application site acne and pruritus that was seen in patients using topical JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib. So we do counsel our patients on this. Now I will mention that the plasma level seen in the TRUV1 and TRUV study of ruxolitinib was well below the IC50 levels for any of the JAK2-mediated bone marrow changes. 
And a lot of times what comes up is that JAK inhibitors do have side effects specifically related to myelosuppression or myeloid disease. And so it's important to think about how do we counsel our patients? Yes, this is a topical. Yes, this is something that we want uh, our patients to use, but we also want to counsel them on potential side effects. So we tell our patients it's FDA approved ages 12 and up in the US, less than 10% body surface area. There are technically no anatomic site restrictions, except that it's not for use intraocularly or intramucosally in those respective areas of the body. But we do have to counsel on side effects that are on the package insert. Now, finally, in the last couple of minutes, Keep in mind that there's a lot of buzz out there that repigmentation and vitiligo using JAK inhibitors may require light exposure. So the answer is, do I use phototherapy in combination with topical or oral JAK inhibitors? And the answer is yes. But is it a mandatory? And in my opinion, the answer is no. I do think JAK inhibitors work well on their own. But if you can add phototherapy, that is an additional thing you can do to help these patients. Now, speaking of phototherapy, of course, narrowband UVB and eczema laser are my go-to. They are workhorses in my practice. But I tell my patients, expect to at least need 50 sessions of phototherapy to know before the vitiligo will work. So I tell them, expect to see 25% improvement after three months, 50% after six months, and 75% after nine months. And this is when combining narrowband UVB plus topicals. It's very important to give patients benchmarks in phototherapy because otherwise they'll either get discouraged with treatment or they'll expect blockbuster results very early on and it takes time. But remember also that phototherapy is a fabulous stabilizing agent as well. Finally, sound bite pearl number three. So we talked about the relapse, that 40% of patients oftentimes can have relapse of repigmentation within one year of stopping treatment. Well, Terry Passerone's group published a fascinating paper, which helps me guide me as well in my counseling of these patients, where we use twice weekly tacrolimus ointment to reduce the risk of relapse to under 10%. Really fascinating where you could pulse this and reduce the risk of relapse. I also have an interesting pearl to share with you about hair dyes. There are papers that have been published that show that there is a 50% increased risk of developing vitiligo when using hair dyes for more than five years or starting before the age of 30. So I counsel my patients who had vitiligo to be very cautious and avoid hair dyes whenever possible. And if they must use hair dyes, avoid paraphenylene diamine or toxic hair dyes with a large chemical base and try to use more natural plant or fruit-based hair dyes that sometimes are available. So in closing, let me share with you some final remarks. When we look at patients who have fully depigmented but only have small areas residual that are left, things like liquid nitrogen can be very helpful as adjunctive depigmenting agents to help even out the disease. And this was a study that was published by Nanya Van Giel's group in, in Belgium in the JEADV that shows that cryotherapy and laser assisted can be used as depigmented therapy treatment options for patients with patchy recalcitrant areas of their normal pigment that's left. So for resistant vitiligo, laser, either Q-switch Ruby or Q-switch Alex, and even in Asia where Q-switch NDAG is very popular, the 1064, which penetrates deeper into the skin has become popular. This is almost an inflammation inducing Kevner like phenomenon to reduce the pigmentation and oftentimes done with one to two joules per centimeter squared and a two to three millimeter spot size. And this is an example that was published in the Journal of Cutaneous and Aesthetic Surgery showing a patient who had fully depigmented with residual normal brown pigment and so wanted evening and laser assisted really did the trick. Also referring back to the hands that I mentioned earlier, notice here this patchy vitiligo on the hands, but this patient was really concerned about the appearance of the hands, a marker of beauty probably for this person's culture. Look at the nice response and the beautiful evening of the dorsal hands with laser assisted. I think it's a very exciting time for vitiligo. 
We have celebrities who are on social media embracing their disease, increasing public awareness, more research is happening, and our organizations like the Global Vitiligo Foundation, the Skin of Color Society, the AAD, and so many other groups are really helping to educate the public. This is several important celebrities who are out there talking about their vitiligo. Lee Thomas in the upper left-hand corner, a Detroit nightly news anchor, very prominent on social media, showing his disease and how he oftentimes prepares to go on air. Of course, Winnie Harlow and the cover girl, famous images, Michael Jackson. Uh, and of course, another actor, John Hamm from Mad Men, uh, who, which you may be familiar with, also having vitiligo. And there's actors and actresses throughout the world who are embracing these oftentimes stigmatizing diseases to educate and empower those who are suffering. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to reach out on social media at Samal Arthasai MD or via email. And until next time or until we meet in person, stay healthy and stay well. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate your attention and I look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Hello, my name is Dr. Donald Glass, and I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today on keloids, uh, on this uh, Therapeutics in Skin of Color Patients uh, lecture series organized by the IADVL and the Skin of Color Society. Um, in terms of disclosures, I've served on an advisory board with AbV, Pfizer, and UCB, though none of that is directly relevant to the lecture I'm presenting today. And uh, many of the treatment modalities, at least here in the US, are not uh, FDA approved for the treatments of keloids and hypertrophic scars. So many of them are being used specifically for keloids, but not their original intent, at least here in the United States. So keloids are the result of an exaggerated response to the wound healing process. Um, by definition, they grow invasively beyond the boundaries of the original wounds. So they grow in the X and Y invasively into the new normal skin adjacent to the original trauma, but also in the Z axis as well, going up away from the uh, plane of the skin. Uh, they can cause, besides the cosmetic defects, they also can cause substantial morbidity. Uh, about half of patients report having pain and a good three quarters report having itch in their scars as well, as well as sensitivity to pressure, for example, wearing a seatbelt. This stands in contrast to your hypertrophic scars that grow in that Z-plane uh, away from the, the, the plane of the skin, but typically don't, in, don't invade into the normal adjacent skin nearby. They remain within the confines of the boundaries of the original insult. These can spontaneously regress over months to years, unlike keloids. And if they are symptomatic, it's typically itch, not pain, um, and not to the same degree. In terms of who gets keloids, they really can happen at any age, but they typically happen uh, most frequently in those in their teenage years and early 20s. We don't think of a true gender bias, though we do see uh, more earlobe keloids on women due to cultural norms of piercings. Uh, there's an increased incidence in skin of color patients, which I will talk about in a moment in more detail. Uh, the upper torso um, is most prone to the feathering a keloid per trauma. Um, we see them more, most frequently on the ears, again, because of cultural practices. And there's believed to be a hormonal aspect to keloids due to there being a higher incidence uh, after puberty and also an increased incidence or exacerbation of already formed keloids. Uh, during pregnancy. They can be induced by any trauma, so surgery and piercings are most common, but uh, vaccinations, especially on the deltoid area, cuts, and even your acne, truncal acne slash folliculitis is enough to induce keloids. The spontaneous keloid without any antecedent trauma or inflammation uh, still remains debated in the literature. And then there are a number of comorbidities that have been associated with keloids, hypertension being the best characterized. Um, there is some conflicting data on fibroids, and there's been at least a couple of papers looking at atherosclerosis or stent restenosis for those who keloid. Uh, there's one paper showing an association with osteoporosis where patients with keloids are more likely to be osteoporotic. 
And then there's now a couple of papers coming out showing a link between uh, keloids and atopy in general, atopic dermatitis in particular. Uh, this study looked at 122 cases of single anatomical site scars, and then 89 patients that had 369 scars in total on multiple sites. And I show it to say that patients with keloids on the ears are more likely to have them just on the ears than ears and other body sites as well, similarly for the scalp. In contrast, your torso, uh, your chest keloids are more likely to have other areas involved besides the chest than just chest alone. Uh, and you can see, especially for the upper limb, when you see someone coming in with upper limb keloids, they're likely to have other body sites as well versus just on the upper limb alone. And so, for example, this individual here, a uh, middle-aged African-American male with multiple keloids on the chest, back, shoulders, arms, uh, even down to the uh, right dorsal wrist area. And a good rule of thumb is if you see keloids extending or occurring past the elbows or the knees, that individual is going to be very keloid prone, as it's rare to see it on those distal sites. In terms of the role of race and ethnicity with regards to keloids occurring, um, it's been shown to be up to 15-fold higher in skin of color individuals versus those of European ancestry. Uh, it's been documented being as high as 16% in uh, coal miners in the Congo from many years ago, and in contrast, less than 1% in those who are Caucasian in the UK or in your Taiwanese Chinese individuals. Uh, here in North America, there have been a couple of studies showing that in the setting of head and neck surgeries, and in C-section scars, there's a three to seven fold increased incidence in black patients versus white patients. The question of melanin or melanocytes uh, having a, a role uh, in keloid formation is somewhat debatable because uh, it's been postulated that those with vitiligo do not get keloids in their depigmented areas. That being said, recent studies showed that patients who have albinism uh, on the African continent seem to have a rate of keloid occurrence um, similar to those that don't have albinism but are of uh, Black ancestry. And then, of course, the question is if there is this uh, aspect of uh, uh, melanin having a role in keloid pathogenesis, is it due to vitamin D being formed locally in the skin, uh, the penetration of ultraviolet light or even visible light affecting inflammation and the ability of these scars to become uh, exuberant in occurrence? Many keloids uh, occur in individuals sporadically, i.e. there isn't a strong family history. Where there is one, it appears to be autosomal dominant in inheritance, that being with incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Um, patients with, of, with familial keloids tend to have uh, more multiple site involvement than your sporadic keloid formers, and they tend to have more extremity involvement than your sporadic keloid formers as well. In terms of your differential diagnosis, keloids are typically diagnosed clinically, but punch biopsies can be done when there is a question about it, uh, sometimes in the setting of a separative keloid where it's been oozing pus. There may be a question as to whether there would be an SEC forming nearby and a biopsy may be done there. Uh, in terms of the differential, the one not to miss for your atypical appearing scar is your dermatofibrous recurrent protuberance or your DFSP. Uh, in this setting, especially if you palpate around the scar, if you feel induration, it's more likely to be a DFSP. Typically with keloids, what you see is what you get, and they don't send roots uh, like your DFSPs may. Lipomycosis, your uh, sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy or Rosai-Dorfman disease can also mimic keloidal plaques. And then in the appropriate setting, you may see neurofibromas or dermatofibromas appearing a keloid-like in appearance. The study from Turkey compared the uh, using the Dermatology Life Quality Index, uh, the quality of life of patients with keloids versus those with psoriasis versus those with neither. And they found that there was a similar DLQI score for patients with keloids um, as those with psoriasis. And as they can both affect quality of life similarly, um, we yet lack uh, 
many systemic treatments to prevent keloids occurring uh, as compared to patients with psoriasis. There are a number of treatment modalities, most of which are more outside in versus trying to suppress inflammation. I will touch on a couple of those at the end of this talk, uh, but I just wanted to highlight the number of treatment options that are available. We won't go through all of them, but many of them will be touched on in the next few minutes. In terms of the approach, um, the location is important. Uh, if there are multiple sites involved, a history of multiple recurrences, a family history, this all suggests that if their surgery were to be done, it is likely to recur without a very strong multimodal approach after surgery. Um, I also try to get patients to determine whether they're more concerned about uh, itch and pain and just flattening the scar, not having further growth versus wanting to really try to improve maximally the cosmetic appearance, which then tends to lead towards surgery with that risk of recurrence. For surgery, which is most definitive day one, we do now have this catch-22 where we're traumatizing skin that we know likes to overly heal when it's traumatized. And so your recurrence rates are high without a very strong uh, post-surgical approach. One can try to orient your scars along the relaxed skin tension lines, uh, minimize your deep sutures to decrease reactivity, ask you to remove your surgical scars maybe a couple of days earlier than you typically would, your sutures a couple of days earlier than you normally would, just to minimize that likelihood of uh, those tram track scars where the sutures were, which can then lead to hypertrophic scarring or keloidal scarring later on. Your silicone sheets are effective in helping prevent recurrences after surgery. So your new scars are helping uh, flatten hypertrophic scars. However, they don't they have very little efficacy in flattening keloid scars once they're already formed. So I typically don't recommend them or use them in those, in those uh, situations. Uh, you need to wear them multiple hours a day for several months to really see uh, any effect. Your interstitial cortical steroids are a mainstay for the treatment of keloids, decreasing collagen production, increasing collagenous activity. I typically don't go more than 80 milligrams uh, per session and have them done every four to six weeks. Uh, you're going to have some hyper or hypopigmentation. You can get some atrophy if you uh, inject too, too deep. So you wanna make sure you're getting into the keloid itself and not just into uh, normal skin. And there's also chelantotaceous that may form uh, over time. For patients where cortical steroids do not work, I typically then recommend using uh, your interlesional uh, anti-neoplastic agents. I typically use 5-fluorouracil. Again, it can be started using it um, every four to six weeks. And then depending on efficacy or lack of efficacy, the frequency can be um, increased. Uh, less of a risk for uh, um, hypopigmentation and telangiectasias and skin atrophy, a greater risk for hyperpigmentation, and because of the potential effect on the keratinocytes, a wound ulceration, which will heal in over time. I typically use a nine-part 5-fluorouracil, one-part uh, triamcinolone mixture um, in terms of doing my injections. And again, no more than two cc's per session uh, of this mixture. Uh, tips to help, use your Loctite syringes to minimize the likelihood of backsplash. Also using your smaller lumen syringes, your 1cc syringe, using Pascal's law, you'll able to get more pressure than using a larger syringe, which will uh, increase the likelihood of getting your medication into the scar and uh, decreasing uh, uh, fatigue uh, over time. Topical tape, the fluindrenolide tape, um, can be helpful in your new scars, hypertrophic scars, and even flattening your thinly raised keloid scars, therefore not having to do steroid injections over time. Uh, you may see some hypopigmentation around the scar. Uh, you also run the risk of skin atrophy and telangiectasias. Typically using it for five days a week um, with two days off uh, per week. Uh, if it's cost prohibitive, sometimes using just plain paper tape and using a very high potency topical steroid solution, a few drops to the tape and applying that once a day 
can also be effective, though there's a little bit more of a risk of, uh, of an irritant contact dermatitis due to the adhesive in certain individuals. Your cryotherapy uh, works by cellular injury and necrosis. Uh, the main issue with cryotherapy is because of the temperatures to freeze the fibroblast, you're going to kill the melanocytes in our skin of color individuals that depigmentation uh, is often not wanted. Your intralesional cryotherapy can minimize that discoloration due to trying to freeze from the inside out, though you will still get some depigmentation at the entry and exit points of your probe, depending on the type of probe that you use. Um, so you decrease the risk of, depigment, of dispigmentation and you can get better efficacy, i.e. fewer sessions using your uh, intralesional cryotherapy versus doing a spray uh, cryotherapy approach. And this is just two examples of individuals having gone through multiple rounds of intralesional cryotherapy, showing the uh, uh, flattening of their scars. However, you can see the dispigmentation and the underlying erythema showing through. Um, laser therapies are becoming are being used more and more. Multiple treatments being needed to uh, improve the outcome for your uh, erythematous scars or your scars after multiple steroid injections, where you now have the telangiectasias. Uh, your uh, PDL works great to help with the redness. It might help a little bit in flattening. Um, we're now seeing uh, more use of the uh, CO2 laser, the ablative laser, laser in combination with topical or intralesional steroids to uh, improve, improve, uh, uh, improve monkeloids. Uh, radiation therapy works well in combination with surgical excision. Uh, it typically is not done as monotherapy, but being given within two to three days of excision, somewhere in a nine to 16 gray in two to four different fractions can significantly decrease the likelihood of recurrences after surgery. Um, the main side effects are discoloration, your dispigmentation, uh, dermatitis, and you may get some telangiectasias as well. This is an individual, a uh, young male that had his keloid excess off the ear, then underwent uh, uh, external uh, high beam rate brachytherapy. Um, um, and then uh, with, the, with the external external beam radiation, uh, it has a beautiful uh, outcome. You can therefore see the uh, hyperpigmentation where the uh, external beam was performed. Um, so looking at number different approaches using uh, external beam versus brachytherapy, your, your brachytherapy has the greatest efficacy in having putting that catheter underneath the scar and radiating from the uh, inside out. Um, followed by your low dose rate brachytherapy and your external beam radiation having the highest recurrence rate, but still showing significant improvement versus just surgery alone. And it's important to have this the uh, radiation done um, ideally within 24 hours of the surgery to minimize the chance for recurrence. Finally, I want to touch on two systemic treatments. Um, one being uh, dupilumab, a paper came out a couple of years ago uh, with a case report of a patient whose keloid melted away using dupilumab and showing that IL-4, IL-13 signaling is present in keloid scars. Um, however, since that point in time, there have been several case reports and case series that have been less than uh, encouraging with dupilumab as a treatment modality uh, for keloids. Uh, there is a clinical trial going on at Mount Sinai in New York looking at diploma for keloids to see how uh, effective it is in pain and itch, in causing uh, uh, stopping the keloid growth and potentially even flattening keloids. So we wait to see what that clinical trial shows in terms of diploma. Uh, I think there is a role for IL-4, IL-13 um, based upon some of the uh, correlations between keloids and atopic derm but it remains to be seen how effective diploma will be for these scars. The other thing to consider is uh, pentoxifiline, um, typically used for poor blood flow or stasis dermatitis. However, there have been case reports showing it helping uh, with pain and itch and decreasing the growth rate of formed keloids, not in terms of flattening them, 
but in preventing them from growing, continuing to grow. Um, we use this uh, many times in my clinic, and we've published papers showing that it can be used to help prevent recurrence after surgery uh, in combination with uh, monthly steroid injections, uh, typically given uh, BID or TID dosing orally, and always just making sure that because it uh, increases the flexibility of the red blood cells, patients aren't concomitantly on some anticoagulant to increase their chance of bleeding. So in summary, chelators are due to an exaggerated response to wound healing. A number of factors play a role in their occurrence. Your interlesional steroids, silicone sheets. Uh, compression can be done, typically done for earlobes alone. Uh, though uh, for burn patients, uh, compressive garments can be worn to help decrease the growth rate. Um, interlesional 5 fluorouracil lasers, radiation, and cryotherapy can be considered if the first-line treatments are ineffective. And then systemic medications such as dupilumab and or pentoxifiline can be considered for patients with severe burdens, also to help with symptomatology and to help prevent chelate recurrence. Uh, thank you for your time, and we will entertain questions later, later on today. Pigmentary disorders are amongst the top reasons for patients to present to the dermatologist. Studies show that pigmentary disorders are more prevalent in patients with skin of color, and this has been well documented in research studies done both here in the United States and abroad. Due to their frequent facial involvement, pigmentary conditions have, can have profound impact on quality of life, leaving patients frustrated, depressed, and embarrassed about their skin condition. Furthermore, quali quality of life indices are higher in longstanding and more severe disease. Greetings, my name is Dr. Valerie Harvey. I'm a board certified dermatologist with private practice in Newport News and Virginia Beach, Virginia. While I see a wide variety of cases, my clinical areas of interest include pigmentary disorders and health disparities. I also have the honor of serving as the current president of the Skin of Color Society. Our mission is to advance skin of color dermatology in order to achieve health equity and excellence in patient care. It's my pleasure to be here with you today virtually to discuss the multiple faces of hyperpigmentation using a case based I have no final financial disclosures to disclose. The objectives for today are to recognize the key characteristics of facial hyperpigmentation and also to diagnose and formulate an individualized treatment plan. We'll go ahead and start with case one, which is that of a 35-year-old woman who presents with a three-year history of dark patches, on her forehead and cheeks. Although they are asymptomatic, she is extremely bothered by their appearance. Prior treatments have included numerous over-the-counter prescription creams, including 4% uh, hydroquinone, glycolic acid chemical peels, and sunscreen. On physical examination, you can see well-demarcated brown patches here on her forehead, but they were all distri also distributed on her cheeks. Based on the history and physical exam, uh, we made the diagnosis of melasma. In my clinic, melasma is the second most common cause of facial hyperpigmentation, second to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which usually occurs in the setting of acne. Melasma usually occurs during the third and fourth decades of life. It's more often seen in women and men only account for 20% of the cases. We usually see it in patients with skin types three through five and they develop irregularly shaped light brown to dark brown patches. On closer inspection, you may be able to visualize both erythema and telangiectasias. Mostly uh, the most common pattern for melasma is the central facial, 
uh, pattern where the hyperpigmented patches run down the center portion of the face, but you can also find the patches on the, the malar region of the cheeks and the mandibular regions of the cheeks. We rarely see melasma affect the forearms. However, this can occur as well. So here are a few clinical examples of melasma in patients with different skin types. Notice the sparing of the superorbital rim uh, here in the photo on the upper left-hand corner of the slide. And then you can also see what we call confetti-like hypopigmentation within the hyperpigmented patches, which is another characteristic feature um, of melasma. The, there is a scarcity of population-based studies describing the epidemiology of melasma, uh, but we do know that its prevalence varies based on the population of study. And can uh, be seen in, a, in approximately 8% of Latino women uh, compared to 40% uh, of Southeast Asian women. And there's an estimated prevalence of over 5 million people uh, in the US being affected with malaria. So uh, the risk factors for melasma vary. Um, five to 50% of women with melasma have their onset after pregnancy and upward of 30% of women uh, develop melasma while they're uh, on oral contraceptive therapy. Complex segregational analyses show an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance and approximately 50% of patients with melasma report a positive family history. Uh, certain occupations and recreational activities may predispose individuals to developing melasma. And one recent study showed the possible association with higher anxiety levels and the higher use of anxiolytics in patients with melasma. So histopathological studies reveal that all melasma has a dermal component and that, in fact, the Woods lamp examination is less precise in darker skin types and really just may be beneficial for identifying subclinical disease. And as I'd like to always emphasize with my patients, this is a condition that has a chronic course and rarely spontaneously remits. Only 8% of patients uh, will resolve without uh, treatment. So again, this is an important conversation to have with your patients and it's important to emphasize the chronic, the chronic nature of this condition um, and to really manage uh, patient expectations um, regarding the disease course and prognosis. The etiology of melasma is multifactorial and likely is a result of the interplay of both endogenous and exogenous factors. We know that genetic factors are at play as evidenced by the fact that as many as 50 to 60% of patients report a positive family history of this condition and we see a predisposition in patients with skin types three through five. We know that hormonal factors are at play. Uh, given the onset and worsening uh, of melasma during pregnancy and with OCPs, but then there's been reports or there's studies showing higher expression of estrogen and receptors in lesional skin. And we know that melanocytes cultured with estradiol proliferate. Interestingly enough, uh, we see no difference in circulating hormone levels in patients with melasma versus controls. We know that UV radiation uh, plays a role given the phenotype of photodamaged skin. We also know that melanocytes proliferate under the influence of UV radiation 
and that melanin synthesis also increases with solar radiation. There are now uh, numerous studies to suggest that uh, visible light as well as UV light induces hyperpigmentation, particularly in darker skin types. Lastly, we are now beginning to understand the contribution of the dermal microenvironment given the vascularity uh, of lesions on dermoscopy, but then also we also see increased expression of VEGF and interleukin-8, as well as the release of mediators such as arachidonic acid and plasminogen in affected skin. We also see an increased presence of mast cells uh, in patient, in regional skin of patients with melasma. In terms of my uh, treatment approach, all patients are advised to immediately begin uh, using a tinted, a sunscreen uh, containing iron oxide. Uh, studies show that iron oxide provides additional protection against UV and visible light, and that sunscreens that contain both, um, in, in, in contain ingredients that protect both against UV and visible light offer significantly more protection um, in terms of their ability to prevent exacerbations of hyperpigmentation. Most patients are started on triple combination therapy, uh, which includes, um, which are usually comprised of hydroquinone in varying strengths, ranging from 4 to 12%, tretinoin and fluoscinolone. I usually start patients on once daily applications and have them seen back and follow up in 6 to 12 weeks for, for reassessment. Side effects of hydroquinone uh, include erythema, desquamation, and pruritus, uh, but you can also see confetti-like hyperpigmentosis, rebound hyperpigmentation, and exogenous, which is something that we all dread, uh, particularly since it's very difficult to treat. Uh, you can see here the stippled hyperpigmentation um, here on the malar cheeks in a patient who was using hydroquinone if you were to biopsy this, you would see the pig, the pigment, the characteristic pigment globules uh, in the dermis. In terms of second alternative treatments to hydroquinone, um, cysteamine is one of the newer agents uh, that we're using. It's an intrinsic antioxidant that inhibits tyrosinase activity. Uh, several studies have demonstrated its benefits uh, with statistically significant improvements in numerous uh, indicators, as well as patient assessment scores at two and four months. Typically, cysteamine is applied for uh, 15 minutes and then rinsed off, and uh, treatment course usually um, is approximately four months. A uh, second study also showed comparable efficacy of cysteamine to hydroquinone. And so I typically use this as a second line treatment uh, or in patients who are not comfortable being treated with hydroquinone or when rotating off of hydroquinone. Polypodium leucotomus is an over-the-counter supplement that's derived from the fern family. It has both antioxidant and immunoprotective activities and significantly improves the lightening effect of sunscreen and hydroquinone in melasma patients. Again, a nice adjunct um, or an alternative to, um, to be used in combination with hydroquinone in our melasma patients. Second line treatment um, and adjunctive therapy for the more refractory cases. Uh, I usually start oral tranexamic acid. typically starting at a dose of 325 milligrams twice daily for, for three months. Uh, this was a study that was published in the JAD in 2017. It's a pivotal, a pivotal trial looking at the efficacy of 
oral tranosemic acid in the treatment of moderate to severe melasma. And this study, uh, which was based, um, was done by Dr. Pandia in Texas, uh, there included 44 Latino women with refractory to refractory moderate to severe disease, and they were randomized to receive tranosamic acid, just 250 milligrams twice daily for three months with sunscreen versus sunscreen alone. Uh, both groups improved. However, the tranosamic acid group experienced a 49% reduction in melasma in their Massey scores versus an 18% reduction in the placebo arm. After three months of treatment uh, cessation, melasma occurred in both treatment arms, but what was noticed was that the moderate melasma patients had more sustained improvements compared to those with severe disease, meaning that for those with severe disease, you may want to consider adding a topical hydroquinone or some other um, adjunctive therapy to complement the oral TXA. Clinosanic acid is a lysine analog, which forms a reversible complex with plasminogen and prevents activation of UV-induced plasmin. This leads to lower levels of arachidonic acid and prostaglandins and consequently reduces melanogenesis. Here are some of the side effects of TXA. It's important to note that the risk of thromboembolic events is low. The main contraindications before starting these patients on this medication include a risk of uh, bleeding, coagulation disorders, use of hormonal therapy, uh, including oral contraception, renal disease, um, important to screen for re recent infection with COVID, and uh, smoking. Here's a patient of mine who completed a 12-week course of TXA and triple combination cream. She has further, she has maintained her improvement um, on just twice weekly topical hydroquinone at a concentration of 8% um, and of course sunscreen. So she's doing well one year out from the oral TXA. This is another woman with long-standing melasma who improved, again, after um, a 12-week course of TXA and triple combination treatment. She has also done uh, fairly well. She's had a couple of relapses, but we're able to get it under control with uh, just topical therapy and sunscreen. Microneedling is considered third line um, for treatment of melasma. These are the results of a recent systemic review and meta-analysis looking at microneedling as an adjuvant to topical therapy. Uh, this looked at studies using both mechanical and electrical repeating microneedling. Uh, the most common needle length was 1.5 millimeters, and they, use, they looked at a variety of topical preparations, including TXA, vitamin C, and PRP. Um, and the microneedling was usually performed at two to four week intervals. And the bottom line was that compared to topical therapy alone, topical therapy with microneedling resulted in additional improvement in melasma severity, um, as well as improved patient uh, satisfaction. Um, they found that the microneedling was in fact well tolerated uh, with no serious uh, adverse events. Next, I'd like to move on to the next case, uh, which is that of a 45-year-old woman of East African descent who presented with a five-year history of facial hyperpigmentation. Uh, she reports that the areas were occasionally pruritic. Uh, she is healthy and not on any medications, and she denies having family members with similar symptoms. She's tried numerous over-the-counter lightning creams uh, with no improvement, uh, and she also denies the use of sunscreen and sun protection. Based on the physical exam and history, we made a diagnosis of lichen planus pigmentosus, which is a 
commonly described entity in India, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, there, patients develop brown to gray macules and patches distributed across the forehead, temples, and neck. Uh, these lesions are usually asymptomatic. Uh, the etiology of this condition is unknown. Uh, possible triggers include uh, ultraviolet light and mustard oil. It's important to note that LPP can be associated with frontal fibrosing alopecia, especially in patients with skin of color. So whenever I see someone who I believe has LPP, I do a close examination of the scalp and also potentially a biopsy uh, to rule out um, that the scalp is uh, affected. Notice this patient also has uh, loss of the eyebrows in addition to um, a scarring alopecia across the frontal hairline. Treatment of LPP is extremely challenging and there's limited data regarding its efficacy. Uh, most data is derived from case reports and case series. A low dose isotretinoin, 20 milligrams a day, uh, did show some improvement in one study involving 20 involving 27 patients. Uh, 24 of those 27 did uh, show varying degrees of improvement. There was a, as much of a 75% reduction in pigmentation in four of the patients at three months, but none of the patients in this study showed complete clearance. Another case series of four patients with EDP showed that a combination of prednisone and low-dose isotretinoin uh, did have some benefit. This last case is that of a 43-year-old woman who presents with a six-year history of worsening hyperpigmentation. She recalled uh, mild pruritus on one occasion, but is, has otherwise been asymptomatic. She wears foundation and concealer daily, but switched her makeup lines approximately seven months ago. She dyes her hair every six weeks and she denies the use of over-the-counter lightning creams. She has a past medical history that's significant for eczema. On physical exam, she had blue-gray hyperpigmented patches across the cheeks, across the forehead and temples, and brown hyperpigmented patches on the cheek. Based on her physical exam and the results of patch testing, which were positive to cetrimonium, we made a diagnosis of pigmented contact dermatitis. Uh, pigmented contact dermatitis is a form of contact dermatitis. It's usually asymptomatic as it was in our patient. Rarely do patients have a frank, um, frank symptoms. Um, it can present with reticulated slate brown or gray hyperpigmentation that's most prominent on the temples and forehead. Um, if you see this, you should really uh, consider, strongly consider uh, sending your patient or patch testing your patients with both the standard series, the hair series, cosmetic series, and personal products as this allergen profile differs from the traditional allergic contact dermatitis. Um, a recent Indian uh, pigmented contact dermatitis study out of India showed that the most common allergens uh, were sertramonium, gallate mix, thimerosal, and skin lightening creams. Uh, the treatment is to discontinue any offending agent and to initiate treatment with topical steroids and, of course, sunscreen and sun protection. Lastly, I'd like to discuss uh, drug-induced hyperpigmentation, which accounts for about 20% of cases of required pigmentation. There are various possible mechanisms, including the accumulation of melanin, the accumulation of drug, uh, the synthesis of new pigment and iron deposition. This tends to worsen over the course of months to years. Its distribution may vary uh, depending on the offending agent. Uh, the main patterns observed are uh, hyperpigmentation in sun exposed areas, as well as hyperpigmentation involving the mucous membranes. Improvement may or may not occur upon dis discontinuation of the drug. So it's important to have this on your, on your differential of facial hyperpigmentation. Here's some common 
culprits. Just wanted to point out a couple here, including phenytoin, which can cause a melasma-like hyperpigmentation. Again, make sure you review the patient's medication list. Latanoprost, which is which can cause a reversible periocular hyperpigmentation, extended release diltiazem, uh, a photodistributed reticulated blue-gray hyperpigmentation, and I think we're all familiar with the blue-gray hyperpigmentation of amiodarone. So in conclusion, it's important to know the differential of facial hyperpigmentation. Um, also very important to perform a careful history, closely review the patient's list of medications, and of course a physical examination is, a careful physical examination is very important. The management and treatment of options of these uh, conditions vary across the entities, but for all cases of facial hyperpigmentation, it's important to start the patient on a tinted sunscreen with an SPF of at least 30 and sun protection are both critical in the treatment plan. Combination therapy usually is more effective than monotherapy, especially for melasma, and patch testing may be necessary to rule out pigmented contact dermatitis. Definitely don't wanna overlook that. And lastly, it's very important to manage, manage expectations, especially given the chronicity of many of these conditions and their recalcitrance to treat. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this meeting, and I welcome any questions or comments. Uh, feel free to contact me at my email address uh, listed there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Sean Quatra. I'm a board-certified dermatologist. And also I work at Johns Hopkins. It's a pleasure today to be able to speak with you about pruritus and skin of color. These are my disclosures. And the outline for our talk will be, we'll first touch on the epidemiology and health disparities of pruritus or itch and skin of color populations. We'll discuss the valuation of pruritus and skin of color and subtleties for diagnosis and differential diagnosis. And then finally, we'll discuss pathogenesis and pearls for management of pruritus and skin of color patients. And I included uh, this collage here of photos because the term pruritus or itch is so broad and it can have so many different manifestations and you can have pruritus or itch without a rash and then you can have a variety of different types of rash. So you can see you know, atopic dermatitis and different skin tones. Uh, you can see urticaria, psoriasis, pyrigonagularis, a dermal hypersensitivity reaction, and uh, many other types of rashes, including mycosis, phagoides, and skin of color, et cetera. So we'll try to touch on a variety of these different topics. We'll start with the epidemiology or overview. Itch is dermatology symptom. So um, this is what patients uh, present to us for. We see tons of uh, itch patients in our clinics. It has a huge societal burden. And I truly believe that dermatologists are the guardians of itch. Uh, if a patient another especially has itch, they'll come to us, even if it's a systemic origin for their itch. So itch does increase with age, has a very significant effect on quality of life, associated with many comorbidities, likely due to the effects on sleep disturbance as well. But there is a noticeable uh, disparity. Uh, in particular, uh, Black patients in the United States are more likely to have atopic dermatitis and pyrigonagularis. You can see here in this chart by our group looking at multi-center data that atopic dermatitis uh, disproportionately affects Black and Asian patients. Uh, similarly, with pyrigonagularis, you can also see that Black patients in particular are more affected by cutaneous T-cell lymphoma as well as a lichen planus. In addition, itch overall as a symptom tends to be more common in Black and Asian patients as well. Just to whet our appetites before we get going, we're gonna look at a lot of pictures uh, today because I think that's the best way to explain uh, what we see at the bedside in our approach. Uh, you can see here, this patient has some eczematous plaques here on the hands, uh, these eczematous lesions, but they also have secondary areas of papular involvement. Uh, I would say secondary pyrigonagial formation and secondary because you have a primary eczematous process. And even through these initial pictures, they're all of the same patient. You can appreciate the different dimensions 
a pruritus and skin of color patients. They're more likely to develop bumps, uh, oftentimes folliculocentric. There's dispigmentation as well. You can appreciate on the legs here that you see areas of both hyperpigmentation and hypopigmentation. So there are differences in terms of the prevalence of atopic dermatitis, which is our prototypical and most common a pruritic disorder. You can see that black children uh, tend to have a greater prevalence of atopic dermatitis compared to Caucasian children. Black patients also have more severe and persistent AD, and they're much more likely to go on to develop uh, asthma than white children, which also highlights that there's differences in environment that can also exacerbate pruritus because we know that environmental allergens, traffic-related pollution, all of those things can set off these sensory nerves that are so close to the outer layer of the skin. So air pollution, uh, living in metropolitan and urban areas can also increase the risk for atopic dermatitis. And there's significant socioeconomic differences that also uh, play in a role for uh, having a greater likelihood to develop pruritus. You can see that families that have lower socioeconomic status, lower educational attainment, uh, tobacco smoke use. Also, even living in an older home, those are things that can be associated with more uh, risks of atopic dermatitis. And what we're seeing is much greater healthcare utilization. So more ambulatory visits, more dermatology visits, uh, patients are more likely to be prescribed medications. They have longer hospital stays. Uh, we know that there are even barriers to getting to appointments for patients. But one of the major limitations that we have as novel therapies become available is that patients of color, particularly African-American patients, are underrepresented in skin of color um, trials from dermatology. The majority of studies have not in the past stratified their results by race. So that has been one of the major hurdles of the disease. So we'll go through and look at pruritus and skin of color, a variety of different diseases. We'll focus first on atopic dermatitis, and we'll touch on a few key concepts. So the first one is erythema is oftentimes used, or redness, as a real-time marker of disease severity, especially in uh, patients with lighter skin tones. It's very easy to appreciate. You can see the skin inflammation, appreciate it truly. And what happens in skin of color patients and patients in darker skin tones is that that erythema is so much more difficult to appreciate. You can see here on this photo as well, this subtle induction of a light brown color. You can also see in many patients, there's a violaceous color. It can be easy to miss. Many of the scoring tools that are made uh, for eczema are reliant on erythema. So oftentimes what that means is skin of color patients may be downgraded in terms of their disease severity and the appropriate therapy may also be delayed. So uh, patients can actually have you know, worse disease, greater disease progression because they're not accurately assessed at the bedside. What I do is uh, have a bedside um, test for itch intensity. It's a simple question. Hey, how severe is your itch? Zero is no itch. 10 is the worst itch. And I usually uh, see how bad it's been in the previous 24 hour period. It's a better marker, I think, of active inflammation. It also helps identify patients who you can't appreciate as well, the skin inflammation, but they are excellent candidates to um, have an elevation or up titration of the therapy because they're suffering from that chronic itch and pruritus. And then finally, you can see the dispigmentation. We'll touch on that a few times, but you can see the hyperpigmentation here as well as hypopigmentation. So let's jump right into the some more of these pictures. Uh, you can see uh, definitely the papular involvement, the hyperpigmented involvement. You can see that there are common areas affected, so flexural areas, uh, which we commonly note are affected across skin types, races, and ethnicities. But then we also see uh, other areas on the extensor, and uh, you can truly appreciate papular involvement, hyperpigmented areas, subtle inflammation, erythema. In this photo, you can appreciate the follicular prominence. These are very, very small bumps that are actually appreciated here. And you can see it on the back too. You can see these very, very small bumps. It's very hard to see the active erythema, the active inflammation, but you can see it takes this slightly darker brown hue. Uh, this is Asian patient with atopic dermatitis. Asian patients uh, have a propensity towards developing a little bit more uh, sorry, acid form scaling. You can appreciate on the arms, especially here, that uh, just if you look at 
just that photo of the elbow, you might uh, think that that would be more of a psoriasiform appearance to uh, their atopic dermatitis. And then you can also appreciate the skin thickening. So skin thickening is much more common uh, in uh, darker skin tones. You can see here the, the thickening of the skin. You can also appreciate this level of xerosis as well that patients have. So putting it all together, what does it mean? Well, there's a classical uh, criteria, especially for atopic dermatitis, for diagnosis. This is made by uh, Dr. Honeyfin and Rajka, uh, you know, excellent dermatologist. And they had some key observations that truly changed the field of dermatology many, many years ago uh, in terms of typical morphology, so flexural distribution and the elbows behind the knees, the fact that there's chronic or relapsing dermatitis and a personal or family history of atopy. But what I would say is that uh, many of the manifestations of atopic dermatitis, in particular in skin of color, may not have been accounted for. So if we look now a little bit more closely, and based on a lot of the photos I've shown you already, things that we would want to adopt for this type of a criteria, specifically in skin of color, are, hey, the presence of papular involvement in children and adults. You can have very, very small, oftentimes follicularly-based papules. Uh, greater skin thickening, oftentimes psoriasiform scaling in Asian patients and thickening of the skin. Uh, fibrosis seems to be a conserved phenotype across many of the uh, chronic pruritic subtypes. We'll get to pragonadularis in a second. That was also um, characterized by fibrosis. And then dispigmentation, you can even appreciate that on the legs um, and secondary involvement of those pragonadules. So to be complete, we'll discuss a few other pruritic disorders that can prevent and present skin of color patients. So psoriasis is less common um, in skin of color patients. It's much more common to be in Caucasian, but there's oftentimes delays in diagnosis and therapy because of the, the presentation. So oftentimes it can be very violaceous, it can be hyperpigmented, and even uh, be oftentimes confused with things like lichen planus, but it can also present uh, with hypopigmented areas, uh, such as uh, the, one of the pictures you're seeing here. Prognagularis, as I uh, mentioned, uh, is a inflammatory skin disease that disproportionately affects uh, skin of color patients. In particular, African Americans are 3.4 times more likely to have PN. There's also increased mortality, systemic inflammation. Our group has found even in the cytokine involvement in the blood, greater blood eosinophils, all of that. Uh, there's likely a role for many social determinants of health. And you can see from the photos here, uh, just that firmness that appears to be present uh, in skin of color patients with pragonage. So we actually commissioned an artist to make uh, a picture of pragonage layers because sometimes folks don't see it a lot. The disease hasn't been actually educated a lot or discussed a lot. There's very little research being done. So as you can see in this Caucasian patient here, there's many of these uh, hyperpigment, there's many of these distributed nodules on the extremities, the lower extremities, upper and lower extremities. You can see that they're excoriated. If you compare that to skin of color patient, at the bedside, we're seeing a much greater degree of fibrosis. We're oftentimes also seeing much larger nodules as well. So there are truly apparent uh, differences in this condition. And you can see across these uh, different patient types in skin of color patients, uh, from black to Asian and Hispanic, you can see the different levels of skin pigmentation, erythema induction. And then also on uh, the far right here, you can appreciate a patient who has prognodularis. But it's not only these nodules without areas of eczema, it's actually interspersed with areas of eczema. So you can see on the leg here, there's many areas that are eczematous, that are excoriated almost throughout. And so that's one of the uh, confusing topics for folks sometimes because atopic dermatitis in skin of color can oftentimes have these small bumps, pragonodules. So when you're diagnosing these patients, you wanna see, are you actually seeing uh, both phenotype being present, in which case you, you know, give the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, or are you only seeing these nodules primarily? And pragonagularis, where you only have nodules, you don't have a history of atopy, that tends to pop out a little bit later in life, so middle age and beyond. And then lichen simplex chronicus is also a very isolated area of itch that can be you know, incredibly pruritic. You can have areas of dispigmentation, and also it's due to this chronic neural sensitization, as you can appreciate here. And then cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, oftentimes it's skin of color patients. Uh, we actually see delayed diagnosis. We also see more aggressive disease. You can see atypical, both hyper and hypopigmented uh, areas. 
And then here's a picture of a recent patient uh, who had uremic pruritus. And so they're itchy all over, they're on hemodialysis. And you can also appreciate that they had this secondary involvement of these skin nodules and even areas of uh, what we may call even curly disease, Briga nodules, all of that appearing. You can see a patient with Natalja parasthetica. We don't have many photos of this in the literature, uh, but especially in skin of color patients, this is due to nerve entrapment from the cervical and, and thoracic nerves. And so in particular on the back for Natalja would be the thoracic nerves. Um, and you can see here this induced macular amyloidosis and that hyperpigmentation these patients can have. So now we'll move on to pathogenesis and management of skin of color. As you can see, the transmission pathway spans from the skin and the outer layer of the skin in the epidermis, where you can see that these nerve fibers, both A delta fibers, which are thinly myelinated, and C fibers, which are unmyelinated, they go from the epidermis all the way through the dermis with a variety of these different mediators secreting uh, itch causing substances. And you can see that the message is transmitted to the dorsal ganglion, the spinal cord, and then the brain. And it's important to note that this, this uh, transmission of itch is bidirectional. So even if you have uh, an, a stressful thought, that can activate your itch. Actually, this happens to me. Uh, when I get super stressed out, my eczema tends to flare. And so there's this bidirectional pathway. So therapies that we are giving to patients, you want to think in your mind, where are we targeting? Are we targeting the outer layer of the skin? Are we targeting spinal cord transmission? Are we targeting brain transmission, which is actually what these sedating antihistamines do sometimes uh, versus topical medicines, et cetera. There's a few key differences in uh, black patients and uh, skin and color patients uh, who have pruritus, they have uh, decreased ceramides, increased transepidermal water loss, uh, lower pH of the stratum corneum, also larger mass size, uh, cell size. So these are some subtle differences. Actually, uh, black patients with atopic dermatitis have less of the classical filaggra mutations also. So we're understanding that there are some of these differences. There also seem to be some disease endotypes in terms of molecular expression. So we know that type two inflammation, IL-4, 13 and 31 are very key for atopic dermatitis, but in skin of color patients, we're also seeing activation of uh, type uh, Th22 inflammation, which can also lead to a greater skin thickening as well as Th17 inflammation. So in some situations, there's a greater heterogeneity in terms of immune activation. And like I was alluding to, there's more systemic inflammation in African-American patients. Oftentimes, this is a consequence of poor disease control. So topical agents for atopic dermatitis and systemic agents overall. We'll, we'll discuss them, but first of all, we're talking about pruritus and skin of color, so we need to know that a lot of these therapies that we were using, especially new and emerging therapies, our group did a study and found that actually uh, patients, uh, skin of color patients, are less likely to receive many of these newer agents. And that could be for a variety of reasons. One, most likely is uh, many of these patients may have um, insurances that make it especially difficult to get coverage for these patients. There may also be decreased prescribing uh, because of an under-recognition of disease severity, erythema, all of the the key features that we discussed. So that's very important to keep in mind that there is this disparity to get these very targeted new agents to uh, patients. So that's something we should all consider. Maybe our patients are getting topical steroids uh, and I can feel a movement uh, now that we are finally getting um, many newer agents topically for a variety of indications away from topical steroids. As we know, topical steroids are incredibly nonspecific. They're effective. We use them a lot, uh, but they're incredibly nonspecific, especially in skin of color patients. We have even heightened risk of uh, dispigmentation, atrophy, telangiectasias, uh, but and most importantly is the dispigmentation uh, in these patients. You can see here some skin of color patients who uh, develop dispigmentation. Actually, dispigmentation can happen if you don't have early treatment and sometimes it can even be chronic. And then also with topical steroid use, uh, you can appreciate sometimes folks can have that hypopigmentation with very, very chronic use. And finally, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is a big problem as well. You can see in this photo on the far right that you can see this normal appearing skin and then that significant degree of hyperpigmentation affecting the hands as well. So we'll discuss some of the different therapies. So there's 
um, phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, you know, Crisaberol or you know, Crisa was one of the uh, agents that uh, was approved a few years ago. As you can see here, uh, there's a similar efficacy across patient populations. Uh, topical ruxolitinib, that's our uh, the JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor that is FDA approved both for atopic dermatitis and uh, for vitiligo now. And there's actually good diversity in these clinical trials. And you can see that there's very significant itch relief, um, very quick. And actually in the phase two study, topical ruxolitinib creep outperformed triamcinolone. So our mainstay of therapy, and this agent does not have risk of high hypopigmentation. Um, so that's you know, highlighting a very important fact. You can have rapid itch relief and not have those uh, side effects of dispigmentation. Uh, again, this is a topical agent uh, that's approved uh, for individuals 12 and over for atopic dermatitis. We have some very novel agents coming out now. Again, this is a revolutionary time in dermatology. Oftentimes, indications for psoriasis lead the way. Let me introduce you to reflumolas. So this is a topical PDE4 inhibitor uh, that's proved now for chronic plaque psoriasis, but also uh, has uh, data for the phase three trial in atopic dermatitis coming through uh, that had significant data also uh, may actually have some remittive effects. There's some data in the phase two trial that shows off therapy uh, patients tend to have slightly less recurrences. So this is another very promising non-steroidal agent. Topinarov is approved for uh, psoriasis now. So this is a new agent. Uh, it's targeting the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And it's very interesting because it's not an inhibitor. It actually uh, increases uh, the aryl hydrocarbon signaling. So it modulates the microbiome type uh, 17 inflammation, type 2 inflammation, all of those things, um, and is approved as well. It may also have some of these uh, remittive effects after therapy for a longer period of time because of these novel mechanisms of action. So these therapies are novel, you know, novel topical therapies just in the last few weeks to months. And I think in particular in skin of color patients, uh, there's an opportunity here uh, to have a decreased reliance on topical steroids. Uh, and they're getting approvals for psoriasis first, but you know, atopic dermatitis trials are also on the way. We have more approvals uh, for oral and systemic agents. Uh, everybody knows about dupilumab, uh, we approved in 2017. There's also sub-analysis uh, that was performed uh, showing similar efficacy across uh, race and ethnicity groups. We also have tralokinumab now, which targets IL-13. We have upadacitinib or um, which is a JAK1 inhibitor. And we can see that there's very rapid effects on itch because of uh, you know, targeting the JAK1 pathway. And if you look at abracitinib, which is also a JAK1 inhibitor, especially even compared to pilumab, you see up front, there's a rapid relief in, in itch. And later on, uh, that's when the um, other uh, kind of drugs, dupilumab and everything uh, catch up. But up front, that's where the itch relief is um, most significant. So that's our whirlwind tour of paritis and skin color uh, patients. Uh, some of our key takeaways are uh, assessing itch at the bedside, zero to 10, how itchy are you? That's a rough and dirty way to um, escalate therapy if needed, because you may not be able to appreciate erythema. There's a variety of new agents becoming available uh, for our skin color patients as well, um, non steroidal agents and also oral and systemic therapies. And finally, just realizing the importance of healthcare disparities, structural racism, uh, differences um, in terms of access to medication. All of these things factor into how patients are controlled and the things we need to be mindful of at the bedside. Feel free to contact me on Twitter at Dr. Sean Quattro. You can drop me an email. And thank you so much for your attention and uh, for listening. So thank you very much. I think we had uh, an amazing series of lectures from the Skin of Color uh, Society. And uh, we've come to the end of the lectures, but not the interactive session of the question and answers. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers, you know, starting from uh, Dr. Seemal Desai. Then of course, there was Dr. Donald Glass, there was Dr. Valerie Harvey, and then of course, Dr. Sean Kavatra. And, uh, Amazing topics, and we learned a lot. I'm sure the audience would have too. Now, before uh, you know, we start with the question and answer session, 
I'm going to hand over, you know, to Dr. Valerie Harvey to say a few words, you know, from the Skin of Color Society, because we started in the beginning, I just gave my address and I said that, you know, why do we do this? You know, it's about, it's a part of this year, the Golden Jubilee of ID Bill that we're having these international collaborations, we are building up on them. So over to you, Valerie. Good morning and good evening <laughs> to everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for bringing this webinar into fruition and a special thanks to you, Dr. Uh, Sakar and Dr. Glass for, for making this possible. I'd also like to congratulate the IADVL on a successful 50 years and thank you so much for your many important contributions to the field of dermatology. I think what the COVID pandemic has done is that it showed us how interconnected we are as a community um, and how, um, you know, there is no more distance between us, especially given the power of technology that allows us to have these educational activities like this one. So we've learned to innovate uh, and be resourceful during these difficult times. I hope uh, that this is the first of many contributions for our two organizations, uh, Dr. S uh, Sikar, uh, as we work together collectively to address the concerns of our patients. And so thank you on behalf of the Skin of Color Society. Thank you so much, Dr. Valerie. And as you know that I've been a part of the Skin of Color Society, it's now close to, you know, maybe more than 15 years, I've not counted. But I've seen it grow, you know, starting with a couple of members and look where it is, you know, right now. So, yes. yes. You know, that's yes. the good part. You know, you can actually see the growth and it's been wonderful. You know? Absolutely. And, uh, Absolutely. Over the last 20 years, we're, we're almost absolutely. approaching 2,000 members. So we have, have, have grown, but we have so much in common between our two organizations. So... Yeah, so I, I've already talked about it, you know, in the beginning. I did say that, you know, there are many things to look forward, like in the Skin of Color Society, the mentorship, the Skin of Color Society, you know, um, meetings that you have, which is at the AD, pre-AD, and many other sessions, which I've been a part of. So that's what I was telling the members. The other thing which is in common between IADVL and the Skin of Color Society, I must highlight once again, is the encouragement that is given to the young members. I think Skin of Color Society has actually been doing that. And I've seen so many people, you know, many of the people who started off really young, they've even been, you know, award winners. And then I today I see them in faculty positions, you know, all over the USA, or they're leaders in their own way, you know, even in private practice. You've actually seen that, you know, growth, which has been amazing. The same is with IADVL because the IADVL also encourages a lot of growth. This year's tagline is 50 years of IADVL, building uh, future leadership and international collaborations. So it was in keeping with that aim, you know, that we had all these things together. So with that, I'm going to now hand it over to, you know, Dr. Uh, Davinder Prasad. I have already introduced him. And uh, maybe we could take up the Q and A, and you know we can join and feel feel free to join in. You know anybody yeah. else also. Thank you. So today we had four excellent talks. So we had uh, many questions. So we will try to stick to few of the important questions for the sake of time. So first talk was by Dr. Seemal on Vitligo, and he rightly pointed out how exciting time we are in for Vitligo treatment as well as research. So there's one question for him, uh, like uh, COVID vaccine triggering this non-segmental vitiligo. So your experience on that? Uh, well, thank you again uh, for the for for having me to be a part of this, uh, Rushmi, Valerie, and the whole team at IADVL and Sox. And it's really been a pleasure to hear those excellent lectures. Uh, Devinder, thanks for the question. So I get that question a lot as well. Do, does the COVID vaccine trigger the onset of vitiligo? And the short answer, in my opinion, is no. Uh, however, have I had patients come in who have unstable vitiligo or who have worsening of their disease that they tie to a temporal correlation between the administration of their vaccine or booster? And I have had several patients describe that phenomenon. 
I will disclose that I'm a member of the AAD's ad hoc task force on COVID-19, and we've actually developed a COVID-19 registry of cutaneous manifestations. Many of you probably know that the AAD and the ILDS has a global registry. And if you look in that registry, vitiligo has been reported as a vaccine reaction, but the numbers are fairly small. So I don't think we any, in any way can directly extrapolate that the COVID-19 vaccine is inducing vitiligo. Now, vitiligo being an immunologic disease certainly could become unstable or worsened due to any stress on the immune system. So similar to how we see post-viral uh, you know, instability, uh, certainly you could see that after COVID-19 because we see that after other infectious etiologies as well in terms of immune upregulation. So in general, the phenomenon is certainly something that could be linked. Is there a specific direct correlation? At this point, I would say no. Yeah, so I perfectly agree with you. Like. You see, like population vaccinated is maybe like 80% or 90% of the population. And as such, we know this vitiligo 1% is there than, uh, as a prevalence rate for vitiligo. So at any given point of time, new vitiligo will be there. So it's very difficult to correlate with this COVID vaccine and uh, the appearance of new lesions or uh, COVID vaccine triggering this vitiligo. So it's another question for you. Do you use azathioprine in stabilizing the disease? So that's interesting. Azathioprine has been reported in the literature to help stabilize. I do not use azathioprine to stabilize vitiligo. I use systemic steroids and narrowband UVB. And I think it's very important for the audience to remember that phototherapy is one of our greatest stabilizing agents. Narrowband UVB itself is a stabilizer. It takes time, but it's an excellent stabilizer. I do systemic steroids, either intramuscular triamcinolone injections, 60 milligrams once a month, every three months. But most frequently I do oral mini pulse. And honestly, I have uh, Devinder, you and our, our India friends to thank for that. You know, you all, anytime I talk about oral mini pulse systemic therapies, I always give credit to, to you all, specifically Devinder, you're one of the people who published on that and many others in India were part of it. So I think you all innovated that therapy and have brought it to the global scene. And I, I continue to help spread the message on that because I think that's the easiest and most elegant way to do it. Thank you. And uh, there's another question is like, how long one should give the antioxidant? So the oral antioxidants I use, the alpha lipoic acid with vitamin C and vitamin E, and then the oral polypodium leukotomus, I keep patients on that pretty much uh, ad infinitum. So I have patients continue, continue that. I don't see harm in that, uh, especially given the fact that we know there's, there's free radical and oxidative stress that's certainly part of the mechanism of vitiligo. Now, if I have patients who have repigmented to their target repigment, or they're, they're satisfied with their outcome and they just want to break, absolutely, they don't have to necessarily stay on the antioxidants. But there's not really necessarily a specific time. And, and as much as a patient's willing to take those, I think they're helpful. Thank you so much. So just uh, uh, one question, like uh, your experience on using uh, topical ruxolitinib. So we are eagerly awaiting <clears throat> here in India because as such, it's not available here. But as we see, it's one of the exciting news, like this is uh, FDA approved, first FDA approved for vitiligo. So in your, I mean, personal experience with uh, topical ruxolitinib. So I have uh, a lot of experience with topical ruxolitinib. I would probably say uh, amongst myself and maybe two or three other people, we've probably used the most amount of top topical ruxolitinib in the whole country for vitiligo simply because we're referral centers for that. So I have a lot of experience with compounded topical ruxolitinib and also with the branded uh, ruxolitinib, which is now available here in the US. You don't have that in India, it's called Opsilura. That's the name of it here in the US. And that's the only reason I'm mentioning, mentioning the branded name so you're aware of that. We also did the clinical trials and were part of that uh, for the pivotal studies. So long story short, lots of experience, highly efficacious, I've seen very, very good results, particularly on the head and neck. Also has been helpful in acral vitiligo, which is of course the hardest area for us to repigment because of the lack of hair follicles. And 
I personally have combined with phototherapy in my use. That's technically off label because the FDA label does mention avoid excessive exposure to UV light. I do think the phototherapy helps the JAK inhibitor to work better. And I do that. That's what I do. That doesn't mean that's what you have to do, but I find that to be helpful. Do you have to have phototherapy for the JAK to work? The answer is no, you don't have to have phototherapy. The, the medication will still work, but I think phototherapy helps it work better. It's almost giving it an extra fertilizer, if you will, as if you're trying to grow a tree. Thank so Seema and Dr. Right. Prasad, I think that's something we can really look forward to because Luxolitinib topical that's going to be introduced. Yes. You know, in really, yeah, yeah, it's going to come up, I think, by next year. So I think that's something we can really look forward to. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So any other questions, Dr. Rashmi, you would like to ask? I think we, uh, while we one come more up question. with the other questions, maybe you could move to the next speaker because questions there are coming in the question. chat. I mean, that's the last yeah. question we'll take for this talk. Is like mm -hmm. any maintenance treatment after remission achieved in vitiligo. Mm -hmm. So maintenance with maybe topical trichrolimus, Dr. Simal is yeah. on. Yes, yes. So what I what I do is maintenance with topical trichrolimus, usually twice weekly pulse dosing, and I have to credit Thierry Passeron for that because of his work that was published in the literature from France. Uh, and I do use zero point one percent, usually twice weekly, on a repigmented area to maintain. Thank you so much, Dr. Simal. I mean. As always, we have given a very nice overview of recent mm -hmm. advances and very promising newer modality we are looking forward to. Thank you so much. So now moving on to the <clears throat> second talk, talk by Dr. Glass. That was again an excellent talk on keloid. So there's one question from the audience, like why the keloid preferably seen over the chest, chest area? Thank you, Dr. Prasad. And I want to say once again, thank you to Dr. Sarkar and to the IADVO for uh, hosting us this uh, this morning, this evening, depending on your time zone. Um, it's a great question. I, I think there are a couple thoughts. I think, you know, quick answer is we don't really know. We just know it's the most predisposed. I think one is mechanical tension, that there's more mechanical tension on fibroblasts and, uh, and the skin with the pectoralis um, muscles. The other possibility, though, is that hypoxia is thought to be playing a role in keloid pathogenesis and with the chest and the upper torso being so close to the heart, that when you have wound healing and a hypoxic state, there's that differential and that may be more, more predisposed into keloids. Um, the further away from the heart you are in general, the less likely keloids occur. And that may be why, you know, dorsal hand and forearms don't typically get them, but torso does and lower legs tend not to. Uh, despite traumas. I think what's gonna be exciting as we're getting into the age of uh, um, single cell RNA-seq and single cell attack seq is looking to compare the gene expression of, key, of, of normal skin and fibroblasts in the chest versus the forearms and trying to get some ideas um, differentiating in that, in that regard. But I think we do know that the chest is most likely to, and if you're going to consider excision, you really have to have a very multimodal and aggressive approach. I would recommend radiation after surgery, pentoxifaline as well, um, either fluid adrenaline tape or some sort of topical steroid and coming in for steroid injections as well to minimize the chance of recurrence. Yeah, thank you. So in your talk, you presented some data about the comorbid condition like hypertension, atherosclerosis. So like, uh, I mean, is it like we need to go for extensive investigations with the patient or there are some soft clue like which are which are these patients like with uh, multiple keloids they are more i mean they are more i mean prone to get association with such comorbid conditions i mean we have such data Oh, again, again great question i, I think this, this the strongest association we found has been with hypertension and I would say the, the patients who tend to have multiple keloids, you know, chest, back, shoulders, arms, especially if you see like uh, on, on the legs, near or past the knees, those are the ones where if you're not checking blood pressure, you should check their blood pressure to make sure they don't have hypertension and that it gets addressed. Um, it's, it's great to have uh, Sean Quatcher on the call because he and I have done some work together looking at the association between 
uh, keloids and, and atopic dermatitis. And I've started kind of asking about it, and starting to elicit it a bit, a bit more. Um, and I think what's going to be great, hopefully, is that things like dupilumab, if it does play out, or other medications typically used for, for atopy may also have a role um, in, in, in managing keloids as well. So I, I don't think, and, and the question with the osteoporosis is how much of it may just be innate to inflammation and how much of it may be due to, you know, multiple years of, of steroid injections. I don't think it's the latter, but we have to at least keep that into account. Um, but I think for the hypertension, I would definitely check. Um, usually, you know, in your physical exam, you'll see clues for, at for atopic derm with uh, uh, hyperlinear palms or, you know, uh, your, your examiner's rash in the uh, antecubital popliteal fossa uh, areas like that. Um, the, yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. So there's one more question from the audience. It's regarding use of retinoids. Are the retinoids effective topical? Uh, in keloid management? Uh, the, sh the short answer is I don't think we know. I've, I've used it some to help uh, with uh, dispigmentation. I have had anecdotally one or two patients say they thought it seemed to help to flatten the scars a little bit, but I don't employ it typically as part of my, my, my therapy for keloid management. Um, the other thing I'd want to throw in there is, if you look in the literature, I want to say maybe 70s or early 80s, there was some data on vitamin A being used, I think, for the, 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 the recognition of like liver, the liver toxicity. And there are some reports of vitamin A being used systemically to help manage keloids. So I think with the, with the retinoids being this vitamin A derivative, there may be something there, but there really isn't that much in the literature to to describe it. Um, there are a couple of case reports of isotretinoin and keloids occurring after use of isotretinoin. I think those are in patients who have had really bad acne and then were started on a relatively high dose of isotretinoin without, let's say, steroids concomitantly. And so the inflammation flared even more with the isotretinoin. And I think that predisposed but in general, I'm not worried about patients getting keloids from isotretinoin, but if they have a really bad kind of acne fulminans, acne conglobata, then you may want to manage them with uh, you know, prednisone for the first, uh, first month or so, and it's ease on the isotretinoin. Uh, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glass, for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So now... Moving on to Dr. Harvey's talk. So she nicely described various hyperpigmentation disorders in skin of color. So we have a few questions from the audience regarding any role of blue light in triggering this melasma or precipitation of melasma. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. I think we know from numerous studies that uh, blue light um, that's derived from solar um, radiation or so, uh, sun exposure can worsen melasma and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is why it's such an important part of the treatment, uh, the management and treatment. Um, we definitely recommend that patients use sunscreen that have protection against visible light and advise them to look for ingredients in the sunscreen, such as iron oxide and titanium oxide, which blocks this particular spectrum of the wavelength. So for that answer, yes, absolutely. Blue light from UV exposure is associated with worsening or exacerbation of hyperpigmentation. In terms of blue light, I get a lot of questions from my patients regarding blue lights and computer screens and whether the blue light there can trigger or exacerbate uh, hyperpigmentation and melasma. And what I would say there is there was a recent study that was published in the JAD uh, where they did a split face study um, of exposure to blue light that simulated blue light from computer screens and patients were exposed uh, eight hours a day for five days. And what they found there was that there was no worsening of melasma uh, when folks were exposed to blue light from computer screens. So yes, it depends on the source of the blue light, uh, but then again, so we wanna make sure that we um, advise patients to wear sunscreen, but then also counsel them and reassure them that their computer screens would not be will not be exacerbating their melasma. Thank you. 
So this is one more question, like your preferred chemical peel for melasma. So my preferred chemical peel is the glyco glycolic acid peels. I do that quite a bit as second line treatment for my patients with melasma, typically in the 30 to 50% uh, in terms of strength, and I have them come back every three to four weeks uh, for approximately uh, six treatments. Um, I find that it works well as an adjunct to triple combination cream, um, and I use that when I have people who are refractory uh, to treatment. I also use it as uh, for people who are hesitant to using hydroquinone, because uh, we do have a lot of patients who are hesitant, um, and I use it as maintenance when we're taking holidays from hydroquinone as well. So a very useful tool uh, for my patients in Virginia. So I think I'd like to add here, you know, that uh, I agree with, you know, Valerie, that it's interesting that in spite of so many different peels and combination peels and proprietary peels being in the market, glycolic acid, I, I think has stood the test of time. So Absolutely. we do use it a lot, you know, uh, even in our patients, you know, skin types four and five. And even the combinations that I use, the ones which are with glycolic acid always work better. The ones where you have, you know, the lactic acid or you have, you know, the mandelic acid added to it. Those are the ones which work better with all kinds of glycolic acid peels. And you have to be careful once you're going beyond 50%, because I think it's better than just to concentrate on the spot peaks. So I think that's again, uh, as you said, it's very important to combine it with one of the other agents, but I think it's good. And in India, we have a lot of topical steroid misuse. Mm. So those patients who come who've already used a lot of these uh, therapies and they have an irritated skin with acne form eruptions, telangiectasia, and you want them to go off, you know, give them that weaning period with maybe moisturizers and other things. That's the period, you know, when I tell them go off everything gradually. And if you don't want to give something topically, maybe chemical peels is something that you could do, you know, after a couple of weeks, after, you know, the skin has settled down. Okay. So That's my nice. little bit, yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so your experience of IPL in melasma. IPL. IPL. Uh, I do not um, do IPL um, for melasma, so I can't comment on that. I, um, I don't have lasers in my practice, so I mainly use peels. I do do some microneedling um, as well, and I do a lot of medical management of melasma. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else is there that who uses IPL could answer whether if Seamal is using or Sean or Donald, if anybody's I, using. I would completely advise against using IPL in melasma, you risk of a uh, significant burn and a significant amount of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. The only laser modality that you may would be able to consider, at least in my opinion, is low fluence Q-switch and EAG. Absolutely. Yeah, very low fluence. You could do pulse dye, like a V-beam, pulse dye, like a 585 nanometer, if you want to target the telangiectasias and the vascular erythema, but not IPL. I absolutely agree because recently we've been doing this low, you know, fluence, Q-switched NDIAC laser, mainly the laser toning mode. And I think it works well, but you have to be very careful and keep combining it with topical therapies, keep assessing after every treatment. And we keep a good gap, you know, almost about uh, four weeks. The spot size is, of course, you know, much larger. That's one thing. Dr. Prasant, he's written that there are four minutes, but you could go on a little bit more. Yeah, so we are just now, uh, uh, last question for Dr. Harvey, little difficult question. So any tips on differentiating lichen planus pigmentosis from real melanosis or pigmented contact dermatitis? So that is a very difficult um, yeah. question. I know there was a recent uh, Delphi consensus that was actually published in your journal um, about the the significant clinical and histological overlap of these entities, and really just combining using a more broader term, uh, the acquired dermal macular hyperpigmentation to better characterize uh, these terms for research purposes and how to monitor these patients. But what I do, because it's so hard to sometimes distinguish these um, disorders clinically is I make sure that I patch test my patients. And I've picked up, you know, uh, 
several cases of contact dermatitis, uh, especially in the patient that I um, talked about in my presentation. So I think it's really important to make sure that you take a really careful history to look for po potential causes uh, such as medications, but then to also make sure, especially since people have so much uh, access to different types of uh, cosmetic products and facial products and you know there's so much um, there's lack of transparency with what's in the in the ingredients of these products I think it's so important to review those carefully with your patients but then to also send them for patch testing you also want to make sure that you um, touch base with whoever's doing the patch testing to make sure that they're testing for things that we know are important for pigmented contact dermatitis because you might not pick it up when you're doing just the standard series. So a really careful history and uh, physical exam, but then also making sure that I patch test people to rule out uh, pigmented contact dermatitis. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. So now moving on to the last talk by Dr. Quatra, an excellent talk on overview of pruritis in skin of color. So there is one general question like uh, COVID vaccination and pruritus. And in your view, is there any correlation with that? So I have actually seen several cases now of uh, folks who didn't have any itch whatsoever. They got the COVID vaccine and actually within a few weeks, they developed various, various phenotypes of um, pruritus that are mediated by uh, immune system activation. So uh, one case was itch that did not have an active rash, but then when I looked at the blood count, I saw sky high eosinophils, IgE. So there's evidence of you know type two inflammatory uh, polarization. I saw a new case of pregonodularis, which we know also has a significant involvement of immune system infiltration uh, of a lot of these pathogenic immune cells. And then actually I've seen several cases of PLEVA, um, in other cases, not to say don't get the vaccine, but we know that it's upregulating immune response that can be nonspecific sometimes. So absolutely, I've seen that uh, in many patients now. Okay, thank you. So there is, uh, in your talk, you mentioned about uh, there is a lack of stratification of the data in respect to the various type of skin. So we are not sure about the response to the treatment in different type of skin versus uh, type one or type two skin. So uh, in your view, like uh, what, I mean, what is the expected, uh, I mean, does the skin of color respond poorly to these newer modalities or it is, I mean. Yeah, yeah. so the lion's share of the trials are in atopic dermatitis, which would be expected because they have, you know, the most uh, prevalence and greatest number of patients. And what I would say is we know that type two inflammation is a central driver there. Some of the subtleties are that you can have secondary thickening fibrosis, like what you know Donald was referring to. Actually, if, when we looked at pregonodularis patients in their blood, we actually found that especially African American patients tend to have greater inflammatory cytokines, also high levels of periostin, which is a systemic fibrosis marker. It's actually increased in scleroderma patients, and so I think that there are some uh, you know subtle differences that are important as well. Uh, there's several diseases where it can be much different, the presentation. If you have extremely like, papular eczema, folliculocentric eczema, you can't expect that necessary flexural eczema is going to be exactly the same. We know that type 2 inflammation is a central part, but that's why there's also important roles for uh, type 22, type 17 inflammation. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that the uh, pharmaceutical companies are realizing there's, there's an effort you know, led by Valerie, led an amazing, amazing symposium about diversity in clinical trials. They're recognizing this is an important issue. And actually, some of the companies that already have approved drugs are initiating phase four trials specifically to study it in skin of color patients. So I think it's becoming more and more important of an issue. Yeah, thank you. So last question is like, in your slides, you have also shown that some of the atopic patients, they, sh they are deep pigmented, like they show more of deep pigmentation. And some of these, they are showing more of hyperpigmentation. And we have also seen in our patients, some of this is a diffuse hyperpigmentation in atopic patients. So any data on like uh, correlation with the severity based on this pigmentation? Yeah, it's a great question. 
honestly, I think that the hypopigmentation in particular happens with long-standing disease that's untreated. Uh, so I would personally believe that it is correlated to disease severity. And it, to me, it really highlights the importance of very early treatment. We can't leave many of these patients on purely you know, topical treatments if they have very severe disease uh, you know, affecting the majority of their body surface area. So I think it's just an urgent um, intervention that we need to have uh, among providers that we want to prevent these long-term sequelae. Because just like you said, I've had several patients, actually Indian patients that I'm following, that uh, had delays in treatment. And now they have these massive hypopigmented areas, like on the legs and other areas. And their itch is better, but I can't get the pigment better. So we, we need to really all work together to understand that's a humongous risk in these patients. Thank you so much. I pass on to Dr. Rashmi for our final comments. Sorry. Thank you so much, first of all, Dr. Devinder Prasad, because I think the questions were very good from the audience. And I think, uh, of course, the speakers gave their bit and you added your little bit to it. We all tried to add a little bit because we learn from each other, you know, over so many years. So I think they were great questions and the answers were even better. Some of them, you know, what you actually do in practice and it's pretty much alike. And uh, I, with that, I'd like to thank, of course, you know, Valerie for having this uh, session on, you know, thank you for doing that because it was very important to sensitize people about the society, what this is doing. And, uh, you know, for others to know that we pretty much work together collaboratively. I look forward to more collaborations. Dr. Donald last because I told him, I think last year that we need to have this session. So he was very cooperative even at that point of time. Seemal, you know, who's always been there, you know, always giving the right tips, what exactly to do. And he's always been a friend, you know, to IID Will. And of course, Sean, whom I believe that I met many, many years ago and kept meeting. And you know, it's great to see you today as one of the faculty here in the Skin of Color Society. So I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, Secretary General of IID Will, to... Uh, Give us concluding remarks and please do stay on because you know we'll take a picture in the end. Over to you, Dinesh. Yeah, are you there, Dinesh? Just one second. See, it dropped off for just one second because we, he was not there in the. Okay. Yeah. So please join here. Dropped off actually. Uh, so he's just coming back. Just please stay on. For, I'm sorry about this for a minute or two. Uh, while we're on this, I'm just going one to question, ask. Uh, there is one question. Yeah, asked. one question. Yeah, there was one or two questions. If you could take them quickly, Dr. Devendra, why do you join? Yes, yes. There is one question like, how long we can give trams in lawn safely? It's for Dr. Seamal, I think. Yeah. For Vitligo, as you mentioned, a monthly injection of trams in lawn. Yeah, that's for intramuscular systemic steroid stabilization. And usually I would only do that up to three rounds. So one, then four weeks later, then four weeks later. So I don't do it more than three times if we need to uh, use systemic steroids to stabilize. Yeah, so this another question is on phototherapy induced Kobner phenomenon. Have you seen that? Yes, I have. Uh, iatrogenic induced uh, sunburn or phototherapy induced burn can actually worsen vitiligo temporarily. Yep, I have, I have seen that. You have to be very careful in phototherapy because a bad blistering burn in the light box can set you back some as well. So for in that case is probably we need to give like OMP first to stabilize or right. some other amino acid, yes. Yeah, just continue the phototherapy until that's resolved and systemic steroids to stabilize. Yes. 
and in your view like this jack inhibitors they are more of stabilizing agent or more of free pigment although some says like any treatment modality would have both effects but yeah predominantly uh, they are stabilizing agent or they are re i think they're predominantly you being used right now in our vitiligo world as repigmenting agents I do think oral jacks probably are stabilizing agents, but we're not using them for st stability uh, at the moment. Thank so you. I think uh, Dinesh has joined back. So Dinesh, would you give the concluding remarks? We came back to one or two questions, even which were left. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Uh, I just uh, took a little short break. Uh, I, I think we had a wonderful session and I was just reading the messages on the various groups that uh, they found it extremely useful uh, messages pouring across India that uh, uh, this has been a session which is like a pretty useful. We've had uh, multiple sessions under the presidential initiative of Professor Rashmi Sarkar. Uh, and uh, this is uh, one of the best attended and uh, will appreciated session, I would say. And uh, definitely the thanks goes out to our president for getting this organized and uh, executing this very well. I would also take this opportunity to thank the Skin of Color Society, uh, the president Valerie Harvey, and also its uh, secretary, uh, Kandrais Di Heath, uh, for liaising with us and organizing this. Uh, we would definitely have a recording of this and we would uh, definitely be sharing it with our members. Uh, just to inform you that we are nearly a 15,000 strong uh, plus membership and uh, this would be disseminated. And this was a very, very relevant uh, topic of discussion for us because uh, we could identify with a lot of points in the personal sessions. There are a lot of uh, points which uh, I could say, yes, okay, this is what we face in the practice and this is how we also tackle it. So in that case, it is a pretty uh, useful session. Uh, I would thank all uh, who Uh, you're on mute, Dinesh, by ex accidentally you're on mute. Uh, Dr. Seemal Desai, Dr. Donald Glass, Dr. Sean Patra, and also we had a wonderful uh, question answer session moderated by Dr. Professor Davinder Prasad and also Professor Rashmi Sarkar. So we look forward for further networking and we look forward for further uh, learning from you people and uh, for the collaboration so that uh, uh, we do something more for the people of the uh, skin of co um, co colored skin. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, end the session and I would like to thank all of you for having participated this on a Sunday. Uh, I understand your family time is valuable, but in spite of your schedule, uh, you took out time for us and we are indeed very, very grateful for that. And uh, I thank even the Medinet streaming uh, for enabling us to have a smoothless uh, session. Thank you once again, one. all. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. And this is, of course, by Regalis. Also, Regalis are academic partners in this. And uh, can we just take a picture? Naveen, are you taking the picture? Please? Yes, ma'am. So, so everybody can just smile. Yeah. Hold the smile, please. Three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good morning. <laughs>